time to start church. Amen. It's good to have you guys with us this morning. We're going to open up with prayer. So would you stand with me as we get, begin to worship here and before the team takes us into worship. Lord, we're so grateful and thankful that we can be in your house today. So thankful for the love that you show us, the kindness. God, the strength that you give us every day, the wisdom. And Lord, I pray that today, this morning, right now, Lord, that we would be able to just lift our voices to you and our hearts to you. That God, it would be a sweet incense to your nostrils this morning as we worship you, as we lift our hearts to you. God, may you be blessed today. Lord, we invite the Holy Spirit, come into this place, fill this place, overflowing, Lord, with your presence. Touch our lives today, and we ask it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. Gonna, we're going to go in time of worship here. It's good to be back with everybody. I'm really excited to be back after being gone for a few weeks. We have a new song that we're going to sing today. Who is so who is so happy that God is faithful to his promises? Amen. Well, let's put our hands together. We're going to sing this one out. We're going to start with, let's raise a hallelujah. Hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody.
up of praise this morning as he is worthy of our praise today, church.
nation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. song here today. God's promises are faithful and true. Amen, church.
sun to the setting same I will praise your
Father, we're just so just so thankful and grateful for this, this wonderful time that we can spend in your presence. Oh, it is thick in here today. Holy Spirit, continue to move on your people today, whether they may be here in this building, at home, watching online, wherever they may be. Bless them. Let them know that you're there. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I want to invite the ushers, if you would, please, to prepare for tithes and offering, if you would. And while we're doing that, I'm going to invite you to uh, get your... Uh, Church Center app opened up to the announcements while they're doing that, and we're going to try and speed through a bunch of a lot, a bunch of announcements. Uh, Nathan, I believe, is going to have them on the screen behind me there because he is always two steps ahead of me, so um, I'm sure they'll be up there. But um, as the guys are coming here, we're going to pray and ask God to bless these tithes. Father, we thank you so much for your um, just your faithfulness. Lord, and how you give us talents and abilities to provide for uh, our family, for those around us, Lord. We just give with a happy heart just a small part of what you have given to us first. So I ask that you bless these offerings, bless these tithes. Let them uh, be magnified and carried to the very ends of the earth. In your name, I ask. Amen. Thank you so much for your giving. Um, so a couple of announcements I want to share with you today. Uh, got a couple of movies going on today. That's kind of neat. At 1.30 at, uh, is it Grace Free Lutheran Church? Uh, there is a movie called Unplanned. A very, very, uh, very good movie. Very informative, very emotional movie. Uh, my wife and I watched it. and It's very intense. Uh, but uh, it's, it's the... It puts a truth out there that isn't really uh, put out there by many people. So I invite you to go and check that out at Grace Free Lutheran Church. Also, uh, tonight, the uh, VC Students for Christ is putting on the Courageous movie at the, at the theater. So I invite you to uh, uh, go out and support VC Students for Christ. Such an awesome organization. And we got some very, we're blessed to have some really, really good, solid uh, volunteers uh, to help with that in the school. So be praying for them as they're in, in an area that not all of us can get to, uh, ministering to students in a, in a way. Yes. Uh-oh. It is free. Yes. Yeah, and, and make sure you support the theater uh, by, by purchasing some concessions because I'm sure they're uh, cutting a deal to the, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock is um, is the movie for the uh, uh, courageous. So that's at the theater. And one thing that we're excited about here, if you haven't seen these, or if you haven't grabbed like ten of them to take with you, uh, take ten of these with you to invite friends to the February 13th service. Um, it's going to be a time to where. Uh, it's going to be a good opportunity for you to invite a new friend or an enemy. Please invite your enemies. Uh, be a good place for them to be here in church. Uh, and we're going to have coffee. We're going to have breakfast, fellowship, uh, time. Uh, we're going to have a lunch, free lunch. Uh, so, And also, uh, we're going to have our annual business meeting to follow that. But um, make sure you invite a friend out for the meal and the service that day. Uh, it's something very exciting. Um, 
Quick note, Wednesday night, youth and children activities going on here at the church, 6.30. Uh, Detweilers and their small group, 6.30 at their home. And keep on the radar. KidCon is coming up. Just checked out who they're going to have um, at KidCon this year, and it looks like a very exciting time. So make sure you are um, finding kids to send to that, supporting kids through the coffee area. Today's goes to kids' ministry. Uh, if you want to make a donation towards the scholarship fund, let myself or Stacy know. Um, so other than that, that's about all I have for announcements. Uh, so we'll take about five minutes here to grab a cup of coffee, uh, say hi to the kids uh, and youth out there that are helping out, and greet someone near you. I got a lot to cover this morning, and I want to get her, get her knocked out in about 30, 35 minutes, so we'll see what the Holy Spirit lets me do here. So good to be with you guys this morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord with everybody. And uh, 
just jump right in here. You know, we're in the midst of the fully devoted service or series, and we've got this week and next week. Next week, we're talking about our household or my household and uh, talking about how that lives out in our, in our homes. So um, that'll be a good one. I'm getting ready for that one. Today, we're talking about being fully devoted to the Word and to the book, I should say, fully devoted to the book. And if you didn't get your hand out, please get that. If you are a guest here today in front of you in the seats, there are these sets of cards. And not only just for uh, visitors or guests that are here today, but the Connect card. If you're a guest here today or a visitor here today, please fill that out. And if you take it to the desk right outside of the door to the left, they will give you a gift bag. And uh, we just want to make connection with you and... Uh, and uh, bring you into the family of God, amen, because we consider ourselves family here at New Life. So if you would do that, as we move through this next coming weeks, we're going to be getting into, and this thing's going to be a hard time again, I hope not, we get this thing working, I really don't need this not to work today. There we go. Now let's see if it's going to work for me. There we go. Awesome. Um, coming up is, and Pastor Wes already talked about this a little bit, our Journey with God, a new series starting February 13th. This is a huge Sunday for us. We want you to please, I've got 200 of these things printed off. Please take like at least 10 of them and give them out to people. Invite your friends. Invite people that you're talking to. Invite people at work. Just invite people. Amen. And uh, lots of great things that day that's going to be taking place. I can't wait. We're going to start a whole series of illustrated sermons with that series. It's going to be great stuff. So please do that. Uh, then the Rooted series coming up, that's going to be starting probably in February here. And uh, that's coming soon. Still working on that. But again, kind of giving you information about that. If, if you have struggled getting plugged into living that Christian life, say you're a new believer, this is a great series because it lays a good solid foundation. It also lays a good daily practice thing of doing devotions and getting into the word and uh, great information for you as a, as a new Christian. So please be looking at that. If you have more questions, talk to me about it, but I'm, I'm really excited about this. This is going to be separate from church, of course, but uh, getting into the word. We've been talking a lot about the mission statement, leading and growing people into a fully devoted relationship with Jesus Christ. As we've been going through and talking about these things, talking about uh, what it looks like to be a fully devoted follower of Christ, to be in a fully devoted relationship with him. You know, and we just want to keep talking about that and looking at what the, that entails and how we live that out because that is very important for us to understand. We can't live what we don't understand. Amen? So as we continue to do that, um, you know, going back to what does that look like, we've been talking about doing daily devotions, how that daily devotions are very important. 30 seconds to 30 minutes, whatever you can give to the Lord and talk to him and listen to him as he's speaking to your heart. And then not only talking about daily devotions, but undying love and sharing your story and then last week, we talked about sacrificial giving, and today, again, talking about fully devoted to the book. So we're going to jump into the message here, and hopefully everybody got a handout. I want to pray before we jump in, and i uh, got a lot of things I want to get across to you today, some stories I want to tell you that apply very much to this. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. As we talk about being fully devoted to the book, your word, the word of God, the Bible, I pray that, God, that you would fill this place with your Holy Spirit, that, God, we would be encouraged, not only encouraged, but even convicted in ways that maybe we need to step up and we need to do things differently. I pray that you'll speak to our hearts because each and every one of us, God, you care about, you love, you are crazy in love with us, and you desire intimacy with us, you desire a committed, fully devoted relationship from us. I pray you help us today. We give you ourselves, I give you myself as a vessel, Lord, that you would speak through today. God, that your words may come out of my mouth. 
And Lord, that you may be glorified in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we talk about this today, you know, I wanna I wanna say this before I get started. As we talk about being fully devoted to the book, and I said something to my wife here three or four days ago, and I said, I just really feel like I need to say this as I jump in. As you well know, if you've been here very long, you know my heart and my commitment ever since I became a believer is I'm going to preach the word. And I could tell you a whole thing about what God spoke to me one night long ago about committed being committed to preach the word. And, you know, the one thing that, that um, and I've I got to be careful how I choose my words here, the one thing that really is on my heart, though, is I preach the word, and I'm going to preach it, and I'm not going to step back from it. I'm not going to, as we might say, pull any punches. You know, my heart is that I can stand up here and preach anywhere and anything out of the Scripture and that you won't be afraid. Because the days that we live in, there is so much going on. And I know that the end times even scare some people. But let me encourage you. Because we are. There is no doubt in my mind, and there's thousands of Christians that stand with me, if not even more than that, that know that we are living in our last days. And I want to know that when I stand up here and preach on those things, that, that we should be excited about it. We should be excited because God has a plan for you and I as believers. And I understand this. I understand because, you know, as my wife and I were talking about this, you know, every single one of us have people in our family that if Jesus came right now, we know people that would not go to be with the Lord. And honestly, that breaks our hearts. But let me tell you this, God knows. God knows those who do not believe. And that's why there should be so much more fervency inside of us to share. Now, as we've talked about sharing your story, again, not to be coercive in our ways, not to do it in a way that is not gentle and with respect, as the scripture talked about, as we talked about here a couple weeks ago. But we should be on our knees and on our faces praying for them. And we should be looking for opportunities to share Jesus because the day is coming. And we should not be fearful. Amen? So and I ask for even myself that you pray for me as I preach because I do not want to hold back anything that God wants to say to us. So do that, please. And continue to be committed as we talk about being fully devoted to the book today. Because it does. This full devotion that we're talking about, when we talk about it, requires full devotion to the book. And I'm going to cover many things this morning. But I want to start right away. Jump right into Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. If you jump there, I'm going to spend a lot of time on 7, 8, and 9. Then I'm going to be jumping around different places in the Old Testament. But it's all covered on your handouts. So when we read Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, let's start right there and just read together. It says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Verse 8, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Again, full devotion. Full devotion requires, or fully devoted requires full devotion to the book. See, the word of God is like, if I can illustrate this, it's like a, a map, you know, that we look at. And some of us that are older, we, we understand the paper maps because that's, that's what we used to use. And I can't, I can't leave out the fact of now, and, and I've graduated now too, if you want to say this, to 
um, Apple Maps and Google Maps, and my favorite is Apple Maps. And uh, they're getting better and better and better because less and less and less. Either I'm getting better driving or it's getting better because I hear this, you know, turn around a lot less or redirecting a lot less. <laughs> so one or the other, I'm even getting better at driving or it's getting better at the way it calculates things. So, But, you know, when we look at the Word of God, the Word of God is like a map. And we've all heard that. Do a U-turn. You know, redirecting. You know, uh, and, you know, I wish, I wish this, as I was preparing this message, I wish that, you know, we could hear God's audible voice like that more often. Because I think in many ways it would make it a lot easier, wouldn't it? You know, stop! Turn around! Now! <laughs> Don't go there! You know, I think about that and I think, man, it might scare us to death, Especially that first time when we heard God, stop, <laughs> however it's going to sound. You know, I can't do the voice like Ten Commandments did, you know, Cecil B. DeMille. But uh, anyway, um, this whole thing, you know, it's like a map. The Word of God even says it, and you'll see several passages. You know, you look at Psalm 119, 105. Psalm 119, 105 says what? Your word is a lamp to my feet. It's a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. So as we look at the word of God, we find that it's our standard. We look at Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man, one of my first verses I memorized, how can a young man keep his way pure? But by living according to what? His word. According to his word. So how can we keep, and it's not just for young men, ladies. This is for ladies too. How can we keep our way pure? How can we live in a pure, holy, consecrated life? It's living by your word, knowing his word. And we go on to Psalm 119, verse 11. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And that's how we live it because the Holy Spirit uses what we've read and what we've studied, what we've hidden in our hearts. So when we come up against the enemy in spiritual warfare, when he's fighting for our soul and trying to get us to go a way that God would not have us to go, then God by his Holy Spirit brings to our minds and brings to our heart those words that we've hidden in our hearts. Amen? Psalm 119, 133 says, Direct my footsteps. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. See, we're no longer in bondage to sin. Hallelujah. We have been set free by his living word, by what Jesus has done. 1 Peter 1.23 says, For you have been born again, what? Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. It is our map. It is our directive. It is our standard. It is all that we need. First Peter 2, 2 says, Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Amen? See, and, and notice this, and this ties in with our, our mission statement, leading and growing because we are to grow into our salvation, even as 1 Peter 2, 2 says. So we're growing as we feed on the word, as we meditate upon the word. Now, when we jump into Joshua chapter 1, verses 7, 8, and 9, I'm going to give you some things here. But as we, as we look at the situation coming from when Moses was leading the people of Israel and how that they went into captivity for 40 years in the desert and they were waiting. And why? Because we had people that went in initially into the, the promised land and the, the 12 spies. You remember that story, the 12 spies, they went in, they all came back and they had their own reports. And out of the 12, 10 gave a negative report and two gave a positive report. And because of their unbelief at that time, they were put into captivity for 40 years until the generations died off. And then at the end of that, and then Moses dies, and he gives this command, as we read in, in, in Joshua chapter 1, verses 7, 8, and 9, and he's sending him in again. 
But we've got to remember all that was building during this time. And if we look at all these passages talking about what he was saying to there, he was giving Joshua instruction. He was talking about him going into the promised land. He was talking about how it was a prosperous land. He was talking about how it was an unknown land. And it was full of new obstacles and enemies and challenges. If you read all of these passages talking about this, it shows the greatness of God and how that he was caring for these people. And let me say this today, he is no different today. He is no different today than when he was in the Old Testament. Some people don't even believe the Old Testament anymore. They don't read it. They don't preach it. They say, no, it's, it's, it's of no consequence that we even look at that. We don't need to because the New Testament, that's a lie from the pit of hell. We need to look at the full counsel of the word of God because we can find much, much encouragement from the Old Testament and the things that people went through in those days. And it stands true as much today as it did then. But as we look at this, you know, as he was giving these commands and these encouragements to Joshua, they were embarking on this new journey, going into the promised land. And notice this, that God does not give them a new plan. God does not give them a new plan. He gives them the plan. And the plan is he gives them his word. He gives them his word. And so whatever we face in life, what he's saying to them, just be true to my word. And he's saying the same things today where he's saying, no matter what you face in life, no matter what comes, trust my word. Be true to my word. True to the word of God. True to the book. See, as we look at society today, which is so fractured, and all the new challenges that we face day in and day out, we don't need to come up with some new thing. Now, there are a lot of people out there, there are a lot of churches out there that are coming up with these newfangled ways. Believe me, you cannot improve on the Word of God. We cannot. There is no way that we can improve on what God has already done and what He continues to do. The only way that we can improve on anything is to improve on our surrender to him, that we can improve on our sensitivity and listening to his voice and being obedient to his word, amen? Those things we can improve on. But see, in our fractured society, there are people looking for new ways. And that's what, church, that's why we need to share the gospel of Jesus. That's why we need to share our story, because you and I have the answer in Jesus, we, you and I have the answer through the word of God. It doesn't need to be a new thing. It can't be a new thing. It has to be going back to the word because God's word is still the answer. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, God will take us forward no matter what. He's big enough. He is big enough. We look at Joshua chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I want to break this down. Look at this. This is incredible. He says in verse 5, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, take up the ark of the covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and they went ahead of them. Now listen to what he's saying here. First of all, what does he give us? The command, he says, consecrate yourselves. Consecrate yourselves. What what does that mean? What does consecrate mean? It means, you know, to set yourselves apart as holy. Literally, that's what it means, to set ourselves apart as holy. It's simply like saying, Lord, set me apart for your glory. I am yours. I am your servant. I am a child of God. I am no longer a child of darkness. I am no longer a child of the devil, but I am yours. And I set myself literally apart in my actions, in my words, in my thoughts, to be like you want me to be. And I know as difficult and as hard and as complex as making those decisions every day and every moment of our lives can be, you know, when we put ourselves aside and we put ourselves in a position that God can work through as his vessel, he will make a difference. Are you hearing me, church? He will. 
And, you know, we might say, and we've used these excuses before, we said, you know, but God, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. Even, even you could say, even this morning I messed up. You know what? God's blood is still effectual this morning as it was 10 years ago. And it's as effectual now as it will be in 30 minutes. God's love doesn't change. God's consecration on your life doesn't change. God's work on the cross doesn't change. It is as good yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? So when we think about this, we just need to understand that we set ourselves apart. That's what my challenge is to us, you know, daily in our devotion, setting ourselves apart to be God's vessel. And it doesn't mean we're not going to make mistakes. Because we will, because we're human. We are sinners. But God's power is in us, and he works through us, and he forgives So as we look at this, he first tells us, consecrate yourselves. Why? For tomorrow we will do, the Lord will do amazing things. How many of you believe the Lord wants to do amazing things through you? How many of you? Come on. Keep them up. Keep them up. Everybody look around. God wants to do amazing things through you and through me. You and I are his vessels. His spirit lives in us if we are born again believers, if we believe that Jesus is who he said he is and that he did what he did. He will do amazing things. We go on, and what does he say? The Lord will do amazing things among you. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the ark of the covenant and pass on ahead of the people. How many of you know what the ark of the covenant was? You know what the ark of the covenant is? It's that gold ark that had the... the uh, The cherubim, right? Okay. The cherubim. Had the cherubim on the top, and they were faced in. And if you've ever seen a picture of it, they're kind of bowed down before the Lord, like. And so this Ark of the Covenant, when they talk about this throughout the Scripture, and why he's talking about it, he said it passed on before them. Understand that the Ark of the Covenant, it's just like saying the presence of God. That's what it was. I was telling my wife, I said, I need to do a whole series, not in church on Sunday morning because it gets pretty deep, but the fact is do a whole series on the, the tabernacle and all those pieces because there's many, so many types and shadows of the Lord in that. It's powerful. It's awesome. But the Ark of the Covenant is, the, is literally the presence of God. And what was he saying? He's saying, take the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. You know what that's saying to us? It's saying that God's presence goes before you. God's presence goes before me. And that's what we should desire. When we look at the scripture in Exodus chapter 33, verses 15 and 16, listen to what it said there, what Moses said. He said, then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. And you got to read the context. But they're, they're thinking they're going into battle. And he's saying, either your presence goes before me or I'm staying here. See, Moses understood how important it was for the presence of God to go before him. Because he knew if it didn't, he was bound to be defeated. And so we need the presence of God to go before us, just like Moses said here. And in verse 16 of Exodus 33, listen to this. He says, how will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? And what else will distinguish me and your people from all other people on the face of the earth? See, the presence of God in yours in my life, the fruit of the Spirit and what he's doing inside of us, that is a, that is a, a sign. It is something that shows people that you are different than the world. That you and I are different because the Spirit of God is living inside of us. And therefore, you know, it does. It puts, it puts some pressure on us because, you know what, that means that the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, self-control, those things of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 are so important to be reflected in our lives. So there's some accountability that goes with that. But again, we don't do that on our own. There's no way we can produce it, but it's the power of God working in us and through us that produces love, joy, peace, patience, and on and on. Amen? So see, God is saying, you know, let me go before you. Let me work in you and through you to bring about what I want to accomplish Because I will do amazing things with you and through you. Amen. 
See, when we look at biblical Christianity, biblical Christianity is this, the great exchange. We see that in Isaiah 55, 8, and Philippians 1, 21, and Galatians 2, 20. See, we are to exchange our ways for his ways. That's important. Our identity is to be exchanged for his identity. I think about John the Baptist. He says, you must become greater, I must become less. That's what he's saying. He said, I want to change who I am for who you are because I know that in you, you are greater and you can accomplish things that I cannot accomplish. So whatever truth that we come up with for his truth, you know, it's important that we, we set aside the truths that we think of, the world kind of stirs up and says, this is what truth is. And we see a lot of that going on today. When we watch social media, we watch the news, we, we have all kinds of things that's being propagated and, and spoken out there like this is the truth. And it contradicts the word of God. And one thing we must know and understand is that if it contradicts the word of God, it is not truth. Because Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes unto the Father but through me. And that God is not a God of a, he's not a liar. So his word is truth. Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Think about this. With our families, with our kids, with our money, with the daily things that we are constantly dealing with every day. What is the truth? See, Paul said it in Philippians 1, 21, and he says, For me to live, for to me, to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, Paul said. I am no longer, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. She, Jesus, gave himself for us. So therefore, we should give ourselves for him. I want to use this illustration that I heard of a pilot flying through a cloud. He had been flying some time, but yet he came to this point when he's flying in and he's flying into this cloud and he thinks this is going to just be just this little thing and he's going to fly through it. And as he's flying, he's realizing, you know what? This is a lot bigger than I thought it was. So he flies higher, trying to get out of it. Still not out of it. So he flies lower, trying to get out of it. Still can't get out of it. So he drops back down, just thinks, man. And if you understand anything about flying, and I, I understand this by reading. I've flown several times, and, but I've never seen this myself. But they say that when you get into a cloud like that, you kind of get what they call like a vertigo, and you start losing kind of direction and even thinking you're, you're upside down and all kinds of things. But he had to remember, you know, when he was instructed, when he was learning, he said, you know, when you can't see, you look at, to the gauges, you look to the instruments. And the instruments will tell you whether you're right side up. It'll tell you all those things that you need to know. And, you know, that's very typical. We need to understand and relate that to the Word of God because there are times in our life when we're not going to understand our feelings are going to dictate things to us that aren't truth because our emotions at that point are controlling us and we can't allow our emotions to control us. We need to let the word of God, which is like the gauges, show us direction, show us what we need to do. So even in the midst of something like that, we need to exchange our feelings. We need to exchange our perspective and assumptions and the confusion that comes in understanding that even 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 says that God is not a God of confusion, but he's a God of order. He's a God of peace. So there are times in life when we can look, and you could look at the last year and a half, and we know all the stuff that's been thrown out there, and, and it, it hasn't stopped there are things that still be throwing at us, and then we stand back and we say, how can that be? And we can kind of get confused if we take our look eyes off of Jesus and we don't keep our eyes on the word of God. We can kind of be confused, and we step back and say, oh, how can that be true? But again, what we're looking at is God wants to lead us into that intimate relationship with Jesus to where we hear him speaking to us through the word and, and through the spirit of God. 
And some, some people will say to me, and I've heard people say it to me, well, how do you, how do you, hear, the, how do you hear the voice of God? And I've I got to say this. I've never heard his voice audibly, almost like it was audible. It was so loud. But it's these nudgings. It's these things that he leads us by our spirit. And, and through the word, he'll bring a, a verse to us. He'll bring a principle from the word of God to us. And we listen to that and we think about it and we meditate on it. It was like God was giving me direction here. He was speaking to my heart. And that's important for us to listen to. See, when we talk about this great exchange, exchanging who we are, what we think we know, what we think we understand for God's ways, because again, his thoughts are not ours and his ways aren't ours. So we exchange and we move into number one today is this, the devotion to the book requires focus. We go back to Joshua chapter one, verses seven through nine, Focus, it requires focus. Your mind must be actively engaged. See, and I've said this before, you heard it. You know, I don't want you, when you walk through the doors of the church, I don't want to check your, I don't want you to check your brains in at the door. I want you to think about what God is saying to us, what God is saying to you. And I don't want you to check your brains in the door thinking that, well, that's the pastor, he's always going to tell us the truth. No, you check what I say to the word of God. Because I am not perfect, and I may make a mistake, and I may be misled on something, and I want you to check what I say to the Word of God and make sure that I'm preaching truth to you. See, the end times, it says that there's going to be preachers out there that are preaching things that aren't truth. And God forbid I ever end up doing that, but I want you to be aware of the fact I am not perfect. And if I make a mistake, I want you to come to me and I want you to show me, Pastor, you said this, but the word says this. I want to be approachable because I'm accountable even greater than anybody else to the word of God. And what I teach you when I preach from this pulpit, amen? But our mind must be actively engaged. We need to be focused. We must be actively thinking and growing. See, we need to, we need to grow and we need to understand in both our hearts and our minds the word of God, the change and the process that's taking place inside of us. That's so important for us to understand. It's not something we can just let happen it's not something that we can put our Bibles under our pillows and we can lay down and, and subconsciously this kind of just gets into our minds. No, we have to be focused. We have to be actively engaged with the word. Let him speak to you. Be thinking about the word as you're reading it, whether it's in devotions or in study and say, be saying, you know, God, how does this work out? I was challenged just the other day in one of my devotions because I was reading through Matthew and it was talking about some things and it talked about how that, that Jesus, well, I won't get into it. I'll be off on a rabbit trail anyway. The fact is we need to be listening to the word of God because he's constantly wanting to teach us. He's constantly want us to, wanting us to be brought into new revelation that we understand something greater and deeper than what we did before. So it's not like you can read a verse and say, oh, I'm graduated. <laughs> I'm good to go. No, because he may bring that same verse back to you in a three or four months and teach you something even deeper than that yet. So we need to constantly be looking. See, Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. We look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. It says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful. This is what we're talking about, being focused and actively engaged. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. See, truth is found in the word of God. And we need to be careful. And let me say this. We're to be careful, not cynical and not critical, but be careful. Be careful because cynical, when we get, when we get cynical and we get critical, then we can miss what the Holy Spirit even wants to say to us because doubt is part of that. But he's saying, be careful. What does he mean? It means study the word of God. When you're studying something in James, then take it and look further. See what the rest of the word of God says about it because you need to look at the whole counsel of the word of God. That's why 
concordances and all those types of things are good because I can look at it and say, this is what he's saying in James. Now, how does this, how does this play out in other places in the book that I'm devoted to, the Bible? Because he speaks in truth and he'll never contradict himself. So we need to be careful, not cynical, not critical, but be vigilant, be focused, be actively engaged with the word of God. See, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, it goes on and says, Do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night. See, what he's saying here, departing from your mouth, you know, don't let it go far from you. In fact, literally, when you get into the Hebrew of this, the, medit- the word meditate, and I'm going to touch on this again, but the word meditate means to mutter. So it's like all day long you may be doing this, and you may think I'm crazy, but all day long you may be running around saying, meditate on the word of God. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Thinking about the word of God, repeating the word of God especially when we get placed into positions of temptations. Because when you're in those spiritual battles, you need to remember, put on the helmet of salvation, take up the shield of faith, pick up the sword of the Spirit, pray in the Spirit on all occasions. See, muttering those things, going over them and over them with your mouth and in your mind and in your heart. You hear me? He said, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night that you may be careful to do everything in it. Then you will what? Be prosperous and successful. See, keep it on our lips. Meditate on it day and night. Do everything that's written in it. See, spiritual victory, and we're going to get into this quite deeply this morning, but spiritual victory happens in our minds before anywhere else. That's where it starts, in our minds. It starts there before it happens in our hearts. See, we think something before we speak it into action. And to win the war between our ears, that's huge. So we focus on the word of God. See, Romans 12, 2, and you've heard this many times, but Romans 12, 2 says what? It says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how do we renew our mind? We get into the word of God. We get the thoughts, his thoughts, not our thoughts, his ways, not our ways, into our minds. We renew our minds because, you know, if you're like me, I didn't get saved until 1987. I was 25 years old. So I've got 25 years of, if you allow me to say it, crap in my mind. Worldly stuff in my mind, in my heart. So all this worldly stuff, and I need, now I need my mind renewed. I need my heart renewed. I need my spirit renewed by the word of God. So be transformed by the renewing of our thoughts. So altering those things. You know, wounds and curses that may have been spoken over us, hurt, patterns in our thinking that need to be changed, that need to be renewed. See, when we look to Mark chapter 8, verse 22 through 25, and I didn't bring this all up, but I want to read this to you. This is about the blind man. Now listen to what he says. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. And he took the blind man by his hand, by the hand, and led him outside the village. And when he had spit on the man's eyes, he put his hands on him. Jesus asked, do you see anything? And he looked up and he said, I see people that look like trees walking around. And once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, and then his eyes were open, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Now, if you take this at first glance and, and, and don't dig into this much, you're, you're wondering, why did he have to lay his hands on him a second time? Now, if we dig into this further, if you, if you study anything about neurologists and, and about people who, who do surgery on eyes, there is something that takes place, and they say that if you, if you have somebody that was born blind, a lot of times there's a disconnection, and they've gotten to the point, and this is a miracle that they can get to this point, but they've gotten to the point now to where they can do surgery on the eyes and make this connection back, and actually they can see again. But they have found that through this that if they wait too long and they have it like an age of 19, 20, 25, somewhere in there, that if they do it after that, 
there's a big percentage of them that don't ever see. They can't see because they, they can see, but it's kind of like what he saw at first. They saw blurriness. And what they've come down to is this. They've come down to the point that they have spent so many years not seeing that there's actually a breakdown in the, the connection to where the message doesn't get all the way there and can't make sense of it. So what does this speak to us about this? It speaks to us this. It speaks to us that, you know what? When, when Jesus did this, he laid his hands on him. There was a healing in his eyes. But when he laid hands on him the second time, there was a healing in his mind. So there's a physical healing, but there's also a healing in our mind. And, and isn't that what Romans 12.2 talks about? Romans 12.2 talks about this renewing of our mind. And I'm not a neurologist. I'm not one who does surgery on eyes, so I don't completely understand it. But I take this from people who have studied this and done this. And this is the report they're giving. But it kind of makes sense when we look at Mark chapter 8, verse 22, what he was saying here and why he needed to do that. But so, you know, understand this, that Jesus wants to touch us and he wants to heal us, not only physically, but he wants us to be healed in our minds also. Because a lot of times our minds need renewed and where they're messed up. Amen? So as we look at this man that was born blind, Jesus did a miracle inside of him. He healed him in his body. He healed him in his mind. Now, secondly, devotion to the book requires obedience. Devotion to the book requires obedience. We are obligated to obey. And I know that's a strong word, obligated, but it's a good word. It needs to be that way. Devotion to the book requires obedience. We are obligated to obey. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, it says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful, which we've already talked about, to obey all the law. To obey all the law. So he's, he's saying, this must happen. This must be. You must obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Now, let me, I want to go into this because somebody might say, well, if we're to obey everything in it, then there's questions that culturally come up, like women having their heads covered and, and so on and so forth. But understand this. When he's talking about this, he's not talking about the, the culture things. He's not talking about those things. In fact, I'm going to read you something out of the Expositor's Commentary where it says, you know, thus the law of God is no, it is to control all thought and action. Everything written in it must be observed because obedience to certain parts only is no obedience at all. But when we take this again and we compare it to the Word of God in other places, it gives us further instruction. Because James chapter 2, verses 8 through 13 talks about this. And I want you to turn to James 2, 8 through 13 with me. James 2, 8 through 13. And listen to what he says here. James 2, 8 through 13, it says, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convinced by, and convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, has also said, do not murder. And if you do not commit, if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged." By the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So what is he talking about? We talked about this in the principles of living in the kingdom. 
what is Jesus saying? And if we look at the whole Old Testament, a little bit of lesson here, back up. The Old Testament was talking about all these different laws and why the Old Testament was given is so that we understood that we could not live up to it. Honestly, that's what it was. He was given so that we could understand, you know what, I cannot do this. So it brought what? Dependence upon God. Because I knew that I had to trust him to help me to live this out. And then we go further, what we find as Jesus comes on the scene, he comes on the scene and what we understand is this. I'm not asking you to obey the letter of the law and become legalistic. I'm asking you to obey the heart of the law. That's what I was trying to get to the whole time. So using the example of covering your head or doing this or doing that culturally doesn't make sense. It doesn't line up with what we talk about, obeying the law from the heart. So what is he talking about? What does he tell us is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord thy God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we look at the first of the 10 commandments. What do we find in there? We find these things about the vertical relationship with God and the horizontal relationship with people. And it's all about the heart. So when he's saying everything written in it, he's saying all of those things, not the cultural things that don't make any difference, but the things of the heart that make the difference between you and me, God and myself, and between my brother and my sister, the people that I serve every day, the people that I live with on this earth every day, the people that God loves. That's what he cares about. And we can go on and on and talk about how that he desires sacrifices and all this, but he wants obedience over sacrifice. And we can go into the Old Testament and talk about all these things, how that, that doesn't really matter. But he wants your heart. He wants my heart. That's what he wants. Are you following me? Those are so important. There's a lot of people out there that are preaching this stuff and how that's so important, and it's legalism. And what it does, the scripture tells us, legalism kills us. But the Old Testament, hear this, the Old Testament is still good. We still need it. Amen? But we take it and we tie it with the New Testament. We see what it says. But that's why he says, you know, obey all these things. And what I want to do is sometimes God tells us to do things that we don't like or we don't want to do. We don't, we don't, we see it throughout scripture. They were being told something that's, I don't want to do that, God. And things that don't come naturally to us. And I'll use some crazy illustration like this. You know, you're driving down the street and the spirit of God says to you, I want you to stop at Levers and I want you to get a gallon of milk and I want you to take it to your neighbor. Should we do it or not? You bet we should. First question that comes to my mind is, why would Satan tell you to do that? He's not going to tell you to do that. The second thing that comes to my mind, you might think, my neighbor's going to think I'm nuts. And with that, I just say, you know, I sensed in my own spirit that you needed this, and I'm going to give it to you and leave it at that. I just felt the, the nudge that God told me that you needed this. I don't understand it. I know it kind of looks crazy, but I just want you to know that I care about you and I love you. Here you go. There are things that God may tell us at times, and see, that doesn't contradict the word of God at all because it just shows that you're loving your neighbor. You care about your neighbor. And I'm not telling you to do some crazy thing like, you know, go blow something up by any means, that would contradict what God says. And see, that's again why we go back to the word and we say, what God speaks to my heart, what God leads me to do has got to line up. It's not going to be something crazy, crazy like that. You hear me? See, he wants to have a relationship that's built on logical understanding too. He wants us to not, you know, check our brains in at the door. He wants us to actively engage with him. So when we think about these things, and I want to take it one more step too, just talking about how the Spirit of God speaks to us. You know, sometimes we, we might say this, we may say, I don't feel it. You know, I don't, I don't want to be a hypocrite, so to do this without 
feeling the right way, I feel like I'm being an hypocrite. You know, you can do things without feeling it and still be sincere about doing it when you know it's the right thing. You can still mean it without feeling it. Because again, what comes? You know, 1 Corinthians 2, 13 through 14 says this. When we talk about supernatural and divine things, it says this is what we speak, not in words taught by us by, us, by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths and spiritual words. And in verse 14, listen to what it says. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. See, there's a principle in the Word of God, and this is in your notes in, in 1 Corinthians 15, that applies to more than just the context of the resurrection that's listed there. It applies because the spiritual doesn't come first to us. The natural comes first. The natural comes first. But as we press into the Word of God and we pray and we ask God to lead us, then He leads us into the spiritual. So the natural comes first to us, very naturally. Then the Spirit of God, the spiritual things come to us. So we need to obey the Holy Spirit out of obligation even when we don't feel it. And again, measuring that against the Word of God. It's just like I say, you know, to my kids. As a parent, we want our children to obey, right? Amen? And if you say no, come talk to me. But as a parent, we want our children to obey, even if they don't want to obey. They might push back, but then we press in and we say, this is what you need to do. Trust me. And they may not be happy, but when they do follow through and do what you've told them to do, then you're proud of them because they obeyed and they did what you asked or what you told them to do. And why do they do that? Because I think part of it could be because they trust us. They want, they want to honor us as parents and respect. But regardless how they feel, and regardless how we feel, do the word. Do what God is speaking to you. See, James 1.22, we talked about this before. You know, do not literally, merely listen to the word, but obey the word. Do not merely listen to it, but obey it. And why? Because it says, do not learn merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, thinking that you're okay, but do what it says. See, obedience is our obligation. Number three, the last one, devotion to the book results in success. God himself is the guarantor of true success. God himself is the guarantor of true success. When we look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, he says this, be strong and very courageous be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left that you may. Now, understand what he's saying, you may. This is what we call in the Greek a, subjunct, a subjunctive or in the Hebrew a subjunctive. What it means is there is a possibility of this happening. That's why he says you may, you may be successful wherever you go. So we're getting into some of these if-then statements. If you will do this, I will do this. And he's saying to us, this is something that you may, if you do this, if you're strong and courageous, you're careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you, you do not turn from it to the right or the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. So it's based upon our obedience to him. Our success is based upon our obedience to him. Then we go to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. It goes a little further. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but meditate upon it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then, then you will be prosperous and successful. How many of you want to be prosperous and successful? Let me ask that question again. How many of you want to be prosperous and successful? Amen. So it's that if then again, do what it says. And here's my promise. Remember, God doesn't lie. What God says, he will carry out. Amen. Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Will be with you wherever you go. So he's giving him all this encouragement. He's saying, if you will do this, 
I'm promising you success. And see, you have to be very careful because in, in the world that we live in today, there's a lot of motivational speakers out there that are telling you, you're, you're worth this, you're worth that. Everything is happy, 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 happy. You're, you're the best of everything, you know, and, and it doesn't matter what. But God, when he speaks about these things, he speaks in very clear language because he wants you to understand, no You're not always this. You're not always that. I'm not going to give you everything on a platter. Suffering comes into the word of God and speaks about it because sometimes that happens in our lives and it's part of life and God uses it. Are we hearing that? It happens. It's life. So let me ask you this question. What is success to you? What is success to you? What is the meaning of life to you? See, the word of God tell us, tells us that success and the meaning of life to us is to glorify God. We are to be this big, huge, blinking yellow light that points people to Jesus. That's what we're to be. We're to glorify him and all that we are. That's what success is. To be obedient to what the word of God says about us and for us. To see anything else, the scripture talks in many senses about, out of Matthew, talks about how the fact that moths and rust will destroy the things of this world, you know, it all will pass away. But what is left is what we give of our lives that will make a difference in eternity, the impact that we will have on people. Because God doesn't love things, God loves people. And that's what he cares about. See, Joshua was saying, if you don't turn from the book, then you'll be successful wherever you go. You know, and you think about as they entered into the promised land, the big walls of Jericho fell because they were obedient to do what God asked them to do. And we can go through the story after story after story of the seas being split and things opening up for them because they were obedient to the word of God. And not that they weren't making mistakes because they stood at the the edge of the sea and complaining and saying, God, why'd you bring us out here to die? They're coming to get us. That's what he did. And then Moses stood there and he held his staff up. And what happened? it opened up. And he did such a good job of it, they walked across on dry land. See, God wants to go before us. God wants to lead us. God wants to do amazing things that we can stand back and say, you know what, there is no way but God. Because he wants the glory. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless me. He wants our obedience. He wants to do amazing things. See, in Joshua 1.3, he said this, I will give you every place where you're, you set your foot. Just as he promised Moses out of Deuteronomy 11.24, he said to Moses, he said, every place where you set your foot will be yours. Your territory will extend from the desert to, Le- to Lebanon and from the Euphrates River to the Western Sea. But how? For us to meditate on the book, then we will be truly prosperous and successful. So Joshua 1, 7. How do we do it? It's through action. It's through prayer. I want to end with this illustration. There was a grandmother of nine children or a mother of nine children, I should say, a mother of nine children. And she was serving the Lord, and she was taking her kids regularly to Sunday school and to church. But her husband was a drunk. He was an alcoholic. Wasn't serving the Lord, didn't know the Lord. And she remained faithful to Wednesdays and taking to the kids and Sundays and taking the kids so that they were going to Sunday school, they were getting the word of God. And her prayer, one prayer was, Lord, you know, 
even if just one of my kids would get saved and serve you in the ministry. That was her prayer. Well, she continued in life. Her husband come in one night and he said, you're going with me tonight to go drinking. You're going to go party with me. And she said, no, I'm not. I'm taking the kids to church tonight. No, you're not. You're, t- you're going with me to party. No, I'm not. I'm taking the kids to church. I'm going to church. And then he finally got, he got so angry, he said, if you don't go with me tonight to go partying and drinking, I'm going to find somebody who will. She went to church. She took the kids to church. About 1 o'clock in the morning, 1.30 in the morning, he's out in front, drunk, laying on the horn, waking the whole neighborhood up. So she comes to the door and said, what are you doing? I told you that if you didn't come with me, I'd find somebody else to go with me. And, of course, he had another woman in the car, and he left. She didn't see him for a little while. She continued to remain faithful to what she knew she needed to do. The end of the story is this. Now, all these years later, she not had one child that gave their heart to the Lord, but as she was faithful, she had five children in ministry preaching the word, and the other four were serving on boards in the church. And not only that, but her husband on her deathbed gave his heart to the Lord because she was faithful. She didn't depart. She didn't look to the right or the left, but she remained faithful. And see, if we will remain faithful, if we will remain devoted, we will. You see this? In there, if we remain devoted, if we remain faithful, we will see transformations. And I put that in big, bold letters. We will see transformation. You know why I put that? Because the word of God does not lie. God asks us for our obedience. God asks us for our devotedness. He asks for our faithfulness. And when he talks about these things, he says he will. There are certain things he will do. We will see transformation in ourselves and we will see transformation in other people. So we need to, even as that woman did, we need to remain faithful. We need to trust God. We need to remain devoted to God in all our ways. Now, again, we're not never perfect, never perfect, but fully devoted. Following his ways, doing what he's asked us to do. So the action point for this week is this to give full devotion to the book, to the Word of God. I said this a couple weeks ago, and I'm going to say it again. I'm not asking for you to be devoted to me. I'm not asking you to be devoted to the church, this church, so to say. Because you know what? I understand this. I understand that I am fallible, that I can make mistakes. I understand that if it ever came to the point where this church wasn't preaching the Word of God, that you need to go somewhere else. You need to go somewhere where they're preaching the word of God. That's living. That's making a difference. And it's being preached uncompromisingly. But what I am asking you to do is be fully devoted to the book because the book, God will lead you into all truth. And he will set you free. Amen? Now, God forbid it that this church ever preaches anything but the word of God. God forbid that you ever have to go somewhere else. And I will say this, as long as I'm the pastor here, that's the way it's going to be. You're going to hear the word of God proclaimed truthfully, and I'm not going to pull punches, and I'm going to preach it in love. God asks us to be fully devoted to the book. Amen? Not a man, not a building, but to the book. We, as people, are sinful. We fall And we fall flat on our face sometimes. God says, get back up. Run the race. Be faithful. Amen. Be fully devoted to the book. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God, for your word today. I thank you, God, that you are faithful. 
I thank you, God, that you are crazy in love with us and that you desire the very best for us. And that's why throughout the scripture, you give us these if-then statements. You say, if you'll do this, then I will do this. You're asking for us to surrender. You're asking for us to lay certain things down in our lives because, God, you knew from the beginning there are certain things that, that are going to come into our lives that are not the best for us. They're not what you want, even though we don't fully understand it because, again, our, our ways are not your ways. Our thoughts are not your thoughts. But, God, you are able to understand all things. You know us better than we know ourselves, and you want to give us life. You don't want us to walk on a different path, going down a, a way that will lead us away from you and lead us into the things of this world, lead us into deception, because that's what the enemy is good at. He's good at deceiving us and keeping us from the very best that you have for us. So God, we want to be people that are fully devoted to the book. We want to be people who listen to the Holy Spirit and not afraid, but we are courageous, we're bold, we're gentle, we're wise to be what you want us to be on this earth, a light that shines for you and points people to the Word and to Jesus, who is the Word. So God, we ask for your help. Understanding our imperfection, Lord, we surrender to you and we say, God, help me. I surrender to you, and Lord, lead me and guide me every day into your word, into your presence. May your presence, as we have studied this morning, go before me, and may I consecrate myself to go into life with you going ahead of me, with you leading me by your word and by your spirit. Now, Father, today I pray this blessing. Lord, once again, that, Lord, that your face would shine upon us, that your countenance would be lifted up to us, that you would guide us in your righteous paths of truth, that you would lead us into peace. When all else is falling apart, when all else makes no sense, God, we look to you because you are a God that is a God of order and of peace and not of confusion. Lord, renew our minds and help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless your people. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Remember, as you go out the door, there are those invitations. Please take these and invite people to come. You know, the heart behind this is this. Yes, to fill the seats. I want to see seats filled, not with people who go to other churches. I want to see seats filled of people who don't know Jesus. Because we're going to preach the word, we're going to share it in love, and we are praying like crazy that hearts and lives are transformed and changed. Amen? That's what we want to see. I don't want to see half of another church come into our, our doors. I want to see people who don't know the Lord. Amen? So share these with people who don't know Christ. God bless you. Have an incredible week. We'll see you next week. between going to one of my best friend's weddings or going to SALT. And I had heard some amazing things that had gone through with SALT, and I just really felt compelled from God to go to SALT. So I took that leap, and I missed my friend's wedding, but and I went to SALT. And God moved some huge, huge mountains through SALT, and I'm so blessed that I went. Um, for the past almost year now, I have been suffering from super, super chronic fatigue where I was constantly, constantly exhausted. I couldn't do anything outside of school and work. Like once I would get off of work at five, I would go home, eat, and then go to sleep. And then I would wake up at seven, go to school, and do it again. I, was never, I wasn't able to go out with friends. I wasn't able to do anything because I was so exhausted the whole time. And so it was Sunday, so it was the last day of salt. Uh, God spoke to the pastor who was... Uh, um, 
preaching um, the week before, actually. It was on Tuesday the week before, and he had told him to pray for specific people. Like, one person had, like, problems with their kidneys, another person, excuse me, another person with ovarian problems, and the last person he said was somebody who was suffering from chronic fatigue. And I just broke down crying because I knew that God was speaking about me. And so afterwards, I went up and I received prayer, and I know that I am healed. Because, like, this week, even though I got COVID afterwards, oops, um, and I was tired from that, now I have more energy than I've had, and I feel so more alive and happy than I have in over years. So I just want to say for whoever is, like, facing, like, that God isn't here, he's not working know that he is, and he is always there, and he's just around the corner waiting for you to come, and he is a miracle worker, and he will continue to work miracles. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks. Amen. God is on the throne. Amen. God bless you.